Hey everyone, welcome to Magic the Gathering for Advanced Players. I'm Matt Sperling. Today we're doing a bunch of high-level gameplay puzzles. We're going to march through several of these in a row. We got ones from Legacy, Standard, Modern. Um, it's going to be a specific moment in the game. I'll explain how we got to that point. I'll give you a chance to pause the video, think about what you would do. Then I'll talk about what the player did, if I have that data. And then I'll talk about the analysis of it. So we should learn a lot from stepping through things that way. This is how I talk to folks that I'm learning from, learning with, when I'm in, you know, in group chats talking about, talking about magic or sharing a play or if someone asks me how to do it. So I'm trying to bring that content to you, show you how I think through this stuff. Puzzle number one, Pleasant Kenobi in a video for Channel Fireball, which I recommend. You can find on Channel Fireball's YouTube channel. Um, Pleasant Kenobi brought a stream of, uh, or five matches rather, Red Prison. In the first of those matches, um, an interesting situation comes up, but first I want to show you the deck list. A bunch of mana, um, prison, a prison deck, a million names for this deck, Moon, Stompy, whatever, but it's fundamentally a prison deck. Tr cards like Trinisphere and Snaring Bridge, Karn to find those types of tools, Chalice of the Void, a critical piece, and then Blood Moon effects, and Ramp to get to that stuff. So not even Ramp, but just Fast Mana, basically Simeon Spirit Guides and Chrome Oxus and City of Traders Ancient Tomb. So with this deck, games are quick, and I'll, this deck oftentimes people will be kind of disparaging about decks like this. Oh, it's mindless. You just you know play a Blood Moon, hope you win. So there's actually a lot of intricacy here because it's not always obvious which which tool do I play, how do I play it, how do I play around a counter, how do you know how do I put my foot on the gas versus play a little bit more conservatively. I mean these things, Legacy is tough with any deck. I promise you that. So let's dive in. So here the opponent has played an Elvish Reclaimer, we use a Spirit Guide to put out Chalice. We, I mean, you know, Pleasant Kenobi did. Chalice of Void came out on turn two, a Braid got rid of the Reclaimer. Opponent played Dark Depths as their third land and said go. Crop Rotation's out of bounds thanks to Chalice of Void, but we know these decks tend to play, you know, Abrupt Decay in the Black Green version. They may just hard cast or, or just play, you know, the the stage and, and make a depth token. We don't know exactly what's coming, but this is our now our third turn, drawn city of traders. And now have we have a, we have choices. Um fundamentally here there are you know three permanents that we want to get on the battlefield. Karn and Steering Bridge, Rabble Master. Oh, I guess City of Traders counts too. Um, and you know we can't deploy multiple, right? We've got a total of four mana from our lands, and then a spirit guide if we want to use it. Well, five isn't enough to play Bridge Rabble Master. It's not enough to play Karn Bridge. So, anyway, so we, so we kind of have to choose which one of these we want to play. Now, Karn that goes and gets as you know this is Magic Gathering for advanced players. Hopefully, you guys know what Karn the Great Creator does. If you don't, look it up. But we got to look at our sideboard. What are our tutor targets? Lattice, Helm, which is for for when we have Leyline in. Fleet Wheel Cruiser, Trinisphere, and Steering Bridge, Spyglass, Liquid Metal Coating, Tormod's Crypt, Great Furnace. So what's relevant here, Spyglass can shut off, you know, the Thespian Stage to, to stop the Depth Token from coming out. It won't stop Hex Mage unless we, well, we get to look at the hand and kind of decide which one. So I, sh I should say it stops one of them but not the other, but we get to look at the hand. So Spyglass is certainly a tool. But with at, at two mana plus the Karn, we can't do that this turn either. We have five mana. So n nothing relevant we can do this turn with the Karn. So what's the play? So right, this is the point where I want you to pause the video, look at this, think about what you would do for over this turn and why, and how does it set you up for next turn, what your opponent might be thinking. So I'll give you a moment to pause the video and think about it. Okay, welcome back. For those of you who tried it, um, hope you spent some time with it. For those of you who just want to look at the answer key, that's fine too. So let's talk through it. So what Pleasant Kenobi ended up doing was playing the Rabble Master. It's kind of a, a natural sequence of things where you play the Rabble Master, your threat, you get a little bit of damage in, and you know the bridge will you, you're not gonna get depth this turn, so you don't necessarily need the bridge this turn. And I think that that is a is a is a big mistake here because if you think about how you might actually lose this game, well, it involves, you know, having a, a snaring bridge out and getting it decayed and losing that way. Um, that's, I mean, this Turbo Depth deck, it really, against Bridge, it doesn't do a whole lot except sit there and wait for a way to maybe get it off the board. So, so playing Steering Bridge first would 
let the opponent decay right now. That doesn't sound great. And so between Rabble Master and Bridge, I think, you know, Rabble Master's fine, although it shuts off, you know, if we draw a second bridge, we, we, we might wish we had played the first one, but still, I'm okay with that. So it's better than that, but I think there's actually a better play. With Karn, if we play City of Traders Karn, the Karn minus ability will let us tutor up an ensnaring bridge to have two in our hand, so when we get to six mana, we can play both in the steering bridges, even if the card is gone. It also lets us, when we at the following turn, should we draw a land or a way to make a fast mana, and Chrome Mox will count because we'll have Goblin Rabbit Master in hand still, we can just lattice our opponent and end the game. So that's so we have the ability to end the game the following turn with a, with a, with a mana source, which is really powerful. We can put two bridges out and play around Abrupt Decay. And that's just how this game is going to tend to go. And so Ravel Master, although it just, it's just not... We're going to actually try to lock our opponent. We have Karn. We have five mana. Let's give ourselves a chance to draw six mana and lattice them. If the opponent does something like play um, you know, a Thespian Stage on the next turn or decay the Chalice so that way they have... Uh, so now on the next turn they have Crop Rotation threatening Dark Depths or play a Hex Mage or whatever, then... We've already tutored for the second bridge, so if we draw a mana source, we can put two bridges out. Even if we don't, we can put one bridge out. So it actually sets us up to play different styles. The opponent, the opponent doesn't develop their board in the way they need to. We get the lattice, lock them out. The opponent does develop into a merit lage. We're going to be able to put two bridges out potentially if we draw a mana source and then play a little bit longer game. I mean, and, and we've already tutored the bridge, so if they, just, like, if they hex mage our Karn, we're just not that concerned. So that's the way I'd play this one. All right, let's get to the second puzzle. This one is from a Jarvis U video. Check him out on Twitch. He's got a YouTube channel as well where he uploads. He, this is one of the strongest legacy players in the world. If you like this type of gameplay, high-level gameplay, strong decks like this, you're going to want to check his content out. I enjoy it. Okay, uh, enough about Jarvis. Let's dive in. So this is this cool Miracles type of deck with Oko. Um, Oko, all the rage right now. Obviously, in multiple formats, we're going to see Oko in another format in a moment um, this is a deck that is set up to control the game and use Oko as a really flexible tool to either pressure other other planeswalkers turn off enchantments it's artifacts rather etc steal creatures I mean interesting deck I think that this deck has legs and it, you got to tune something like this it's in the early days but I like where Oko is positioned in legacy and the situation it, this is a game one we don't know exactly what our opponent is playing, but the opponent has fetched an Underground Sea and cast Preordain. Jarvis draws a card for the turn. His hand is two islands, a tundra, two swords, Preordain, Counterbalance, Ponder. Jarvis says in the chat, you know, I'm going to use my cantrips as if my opponent is playing Storm. Underground Sea, Preordain, it's, that's the most likely, it's most likely Storm with that opening. And also Storm is very popular right now. So the Storm deck that Cyrus Cormagill won a Grand Prix with a couple weeks ago, it's Underground Sea Preordained. We're going to assume it's that. At least Jarvis was going to, and I agree with that. So assume you're playing against Storm, or, or not, whatever. You can make that part of the play. Pause the video. What do you do in your turn one? And why? Okay. Welcome back to those of you who tried it. And for those of you who just want to hear the discussion, here it is. So what Jarvis said, Jarvis said, you know, I don't want to use my... So I have my counterbalance, most important card. I don't want to use my ponder without a fetch. Let me preordain. He preordained. Um, that's what he chose to do. I think that's actually a, a significant mistake because counterbalance is not only your most important card, but your opponent's turn two, when you have counterbalance on the draw, their turn two becomes their most important turn. Because they can either duress it or thought seize it and get rid of the counterbalance if you're not able to counter that. Or they can go off some of the time on their turn too. They preordain one top, one bottom. That's potentially relevant. I mean, bottom, bottom certainly would make it less likely that you were going to get either, you know, disrupted or killed. But top, bottom, you know, you could get killed, you could get disrupted. And Ponder simply sees more cards to get to Force of Will or Force of Negation. If you go back to the deck list... Jarvis is playing one Force of Negation, four Force of Will. So there's five cards that will have a tremendous impact on turn two. And, you know, there's some other cards that will have an impact. I mean, the second counterbalance protects you from Thoughtseize. 
So, you know, finding the other counterbalance would be good. I mean, you know, there's other things that are relevant. Spell Pierce, a card you just want in general against Storm. So, you know, relevant. But if we assume, I mean, but those aren't as relevant as, look, if I can force of wills to either stay alive or stop a hand disruption and drop my counterbalance, I'm in pretty good shape. The other thing that Ponder does is it actually lets you shape the top of your deck the turn you play counterbalance if things go according to plan. Preordain doesn't. With Preordain, even if you top top, you'll have drawn two cards by the time you play counterbalance. So the way it played out, Jarvis won this game easily, but I think he actually sacrificed quite a bit. By, and how much? So this is the Preordain math. Again, we've done this in the past. We, Google Hypergeometric Calculator, the StatCast has a, or StatTrek rather has a, a tool you can use. It's just, it does the math for you, but basically, if you want to do this by hand, it's not that hard, you know, five divided by 52 times, you know, you, you can you can, you can can do it on the back of the envelope, but this calculator will just make it so you don't have to. All right, so population size, 52. There's 52 cards left in the deck. Five of them, number of successes, five of them are either force of will or force of negation. I'm gonna look at my three cards at preordain, bottom, bottom, and then draw the third, so, I only look at two, but I have access to three. So how often is a force of will or force of negation in those top three cards? The answer appears at the bottom. There's at least one force of will or force of negation 26.6% of the time. So that's the line that Jarvis took. If we're thinking about purely how often do I get force of will and force of negation, and critically, I think that's what you should be doing is thinking about that because it's so important. How, okay, so what does that mean for... For ponder, well, ponder. First of all, you look at three cards, so you actually end up with the same. You start here. You, what are the chances you see in those three cards? It's the same twenty-six point six percent. But you also get if you shuffle one more card to find a five of, and that's nine point six percent based on that chart at the bottom. Same thing. One this time it's sample of one because we have shuffled. It's still fifty-two cards because we're shuffling. Look at one. What are the odds that it's one of those five? Nine point six percent. So now I wanted to just kind of show my math a little bit. How do we combine those? Well, you want to think about First of all, the probability that this is a really important when you're doing this kind of probability stuff when it comes to magic and drawing cards, the probability of you that you miss is always one minus the probability that you hit and vice versa. And so you, you'll use that to do, let yourself do easier math. So here, we're going to calculate the probability that we don't see a force of will, a force of negation. Then at the end, we'll subtract that from one to get the probability that we actually find it. Okay. The probability that we miss on the first three times the probability we miss after we shuffle is the probability that we missed. Of all the times we missed in the first three, the portion, the you know, the fraction of that of those experiences in which we also miss after shuffle are the times that we miss completely. So one minus the probability of hitting in the first three, one minus the 26.6 we talked about, time, because remember, the probability of miss is one minus the probability to hit times one minus the probability of hitting the one, so that you just do that math across, and you multiply across, you'll get 66.3% six, chance of missing with ponder. We subtract one from, we subtract that chance of missing from one, we get 33.6% chance of getting it with ponder. So that was, more in depth than maybe what you wanted to hear, but I think it, we gotta do this a couple times. You'll get used to it if you're if you're new to this kind of like study at home. This is important. This that's the answer, right? Thirty three point six percent chance of getting a force of will or force of negation if we ponder significantly more than if we preordain. Now thirty three point six maybe doesn't sound all that much bigger than twenty six point six. It's a, it's a lot more. It's you know it's around twenty. It's around twenty six percent more. You know the intuitive answer. I'm seeing four cards instead of seeing three. The intuitive okay, it's about twenty five percent better. I mean, yeah, that's something like that. I mean, it's actually about twenty six percent, but whatever. It's it, it's a big. I mean, that's huge. Talking about you know, if I add that, if I simply added that to my game win percent, obviously it'd be massive. I could go from forty percent to win the game to sixty five percent to win the game, but it doesn't work that way. But it's still very very important. Um, the difference between how often we're going to have that force of will, force of negation. So I wanted to show the math behind it, and Jarvis blew it. So that's the takeaway here. No, I mean, obviously the takeaway here is just that it's, think about what really matters in the game. There's a heuristic going on. I'm going to use my preordain first because it's better in the early turn shaping, shaping my first couple turns. I'll use the ponder later because it's better with a fetch. That's a general heuristic that Jarvis just, you know, applied here in a situation where it actually backfired and it wasn't quite right. That's going to come up. Jarvis still one of the best legacy players out there. Just I thought this play something we could all learn from. All right, so Jarvis blew it. Puzzle number three.
We're back to Oko. This time we're in standard, though. VTCLA, a uh, very talented player who often puts up 5-0 results. If you look at published league results, you know, just a good online player, not someone you want to get paired up against on Magic Online, sent, sent me this. Here's his post-board configuration. So this is what his deck looks like after board against Mono Red. Finds himself on the draw against Mono Red and has already mulled the six. This is a clear keep. That's not the puzzle. The puzzle is what card do you put on the bottom of your deck? With the London Mulligan, you're going to keep six, put one on the bottom. Which card would you bottom? Pause the video. Think about it. So pause the video here. Think about what card would you put on the bottom against Mono Red on the draw. All right. Welcome back. Those of you who tried it. Those of you who just want to get into the discussion, here we go. This is not an easy bottom. I mean, you've got, you can make an argument for Pelt Collector being the card you put on the bottom. I mean, you have to shock yourself to play it against Mono Red. That's not great. It doesn't play all that well on the draw against Mono Red because they have cards, you know, like the the Giant that, that will just shock that thing. And, you know, it kind of walks into that. They have actual shock. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get rid of it. That, that now they've kind of gotten to get, deal two to the face also because you shocked yourself to play it. That doesn't sound all that great. Um, on the other hand, Scargan Hellkite, a card that costs five. And, you know, yeah, it's valuable to have turn five or if we hit five, you know, lineups in a row or turn six or whatever. But our deck is not all that cheap in general. So if we draw if we draw even one or two more expensive cards, we we may we could easily wish that we bottomed the Scargan Hellkite. If we draw a bunch of lands and cheap stuff, we might wish we kept it. The Oko is a card we could put on the bottom. Um, again, we're gonna have to shock ourselves to play it. We're on the draw, so it's a little bit slow. And if we don't have a board presence when we cast it, if the opponent has just removed everything, then we we may be in trouble. Make we may be making a food token and then having our Oko die and just be overrun. So there's an art, you know, Zyrtog Goblin, an effective two drop as a three three. Probably not a card we're gonna want to bottom, but I think Pelt Collector, Scarg, and Hellkite, Oko, you, we can make an argument. Um, so let's take a look at the red deck just to get a sense if you're not, if you haven't been playing much standard, the red deck. This is just a you know kind of a basic example. Bone Crusher, Giant, like I mentioned, Shock, just easy ways to get rid of a Pelt Collector, and then just a bunch of pressure in the form of Robber the Rich was a, a popular two drop, Steamkin, a staple. Um, and then in sideboard, I've highlighted Lava Coil, a card that's that almost all these decks play for that comes in against a deck like Red Green, so that cards like Zertog Goblin don't just blank you or critically, you know, the or I shouldn't say the Questing Beast, but Questing Beast. Um, so, anyways, so that's a little bit about what the red deck looks like. So you're on the draw. What do you put back? Pause the video. Think about it. Oh, sorry. We already do. We already do that. Don't pause the video again. But I think that. In, in my opinion, I'm going to put Skargan Hellkite back, but it's really close. So I think that if our, if my deck had didn't have as much top end as it, if it wasn't as top heavy as it is with Questing Beasts and Wicked Wolves, then I'd probably, you know, I, I'd think hard about putting Pelt Collector back. But I think here, we just, even though, yes, Bone Crusher Giant might, you know, come in. That's actually, that could actually save us damage if it's preventing their curve, the, the, run, the Runaway Steamkin. Um, maybe the opponent, you know, lets it go and, and plays their threat, and then you know we get to play our Zertog Goblin, and now they can only, which is a very common play pattern, right? They're gonna they have a removal spell, but now on their turn three, they may not be able to kill both creatures, and now they're they may have something like you know Bone Crusher Giant and Lava Coil in hand, but only be able to kill one, and now my Oko comes down, and that's really important. So I think for me, if you look at how this likely to play out, the fact that Oko plus one, make one of these Pelt Collector or Zyrtog Goblin, either one of them being in play, will then become a 4-4, four, four, a 3-3 three, three base plus the plus the counter to protect Oko with a, that blocker. Like, that sounds attractive enough to me that I think I just want to curve out. Being on board in this standard is super, super, super important. I mean, Martin Juzo, who's had a lot of success in the standard, talks about it all the time. That's what I've noticed, too, when I play. There's not a lot of cards that get you back into the game. They're just cards that help you cement your position, increment your position, but you really got to be playing onto the board. And the Skargan Hellcat in my hand, I think, is a little bit too poor. Even though, I, I mean, I like to have a 5-5 in my hand because like, uh, clearly Lava Coil, I mean, Planeswalkers, after sideboard, I mean, 
It's not like Skarg and Hellkite is not, and you know, there's Red Cat melee card that's popular, deals four damage. Again, so not like Skarg and Hellkite is a card I don't want. I actually do want Skarg and Hellkite. It's good in this matchup when things can get grindy, and having five toughness can all of a sudden matter. But I think curving out is just a little bit more important. All right, let's go to modern. Tron. This one comes via Paul Rietzel. We lost game one. The opponent is playing the Amulet Titan. So an Amulet Titan combo deck. Paul has already mulled the six. These are the six. Forest, Sanctum of Ugin, Chromatic Sphere, Walking Ballista, Ulamog, Sylvan Scrying, Sylvan Scrying. Two things I want you to think about if you're going to pause the video. If you're going to pause the video, I'm thinking about do you keep this or do you mold the five? And if you do keep it, what would you bottom? So pause the video. If you keep this, what would you bottom? Or would you keep it? Or and would you keep it? All right. Welcome back to those of you who paused the video. For those of you who just want to get into it, let's do it. So for me, I think a fundamental mistake that Tron players make is keeping hands that involve playing lands like Forest and Sanctum of Ugin and then starting to find their Tron pieces. These hands tend to be too slow, and especially against a combo deck, like which Amulet is. We especially like for me, the fact that I'm gonna have to play one, maybe even two lands to the board in order to get going, and then I'm hoping to play Ulamog, but because I got this force out, that's not even going to be there, turn four, or, you know, a lot has to go right, and I actually, with the, with the Paris, with the London Mulligan, rather, you get a lot of equity against combo just from having your turn three Karn draws, on just turn three Karn, like, if you said, look, instead of having this hand of six cards, I'll take only my equity from turn three Karn. I think you, that might even be better. And obviously, like, you have more equity than just turn three Karn. I mean, there's other stuff you can do. You know, you have other tools that are certainly going to be somewhat useful against Amulet. But if you just gave me the turn three Karn equity, I might take it. And so that's how poor a draw like this is to me. So Paul ended up keeping it. Paul kept it. And then what would you bottom? Well, he ended up bottoming Sanctum of Ugin, which I think is smart because... If you ever have to play, like, you know, he's going to turn one sphere, turn two, sack it. If his top card, if his top two cards of his deck aren't a Tron piece, he's so far behind that the hand is kind of hopelessly behind. So I kind of, I, I like what he did with bottoming the Saints of Ugin. Like, that's a clever play, but I think he just shouldn't have kept it. If you're going to keep it and the hand had, let's say, like, the Walking Ballista was a Karn... Then yeah, you still then his it might be a keep at that point because then if one of the top two cards is a Tron land, eh, it's still it's still pretty weak. But anyways, for this I think it's a clear mull. And I think the you know bottoming one of the Sanctum Ugin shows that shows he's thinking about it the right way that you actually can't against a combo deck just be playing non Tron pieces for your first couple of turns and hope to win. But he should have just reasoned one step further and just shipped it back and taken his luck with five. And lastly, against a combo deck like you're not you know look you're not gonna get thoughtsies like. You shouldn't be par you shouldn't be paranoid about going to five with a deck like Tron. Like I said, you can find the turn three Tron. You can find some kind of fast clock. You can find some kind of Karn draw, whatever. You know that's Karn draw, not card draw. Then that sounds a lot better to me than playing Forest, right? So keep that in mind if you're playing Tron. So to sum up, Paul blew it by keeping. Lastly, somewhat of a freebie, but a hand I had fun discussing. Puzzle number five, Vintage Storm Hand, brought to you by Brian Koval, who. who Uploads his stuff to YouTube as well. He's on Twitch, so check his stuff out. I tweeted out not too long ago, but I still recommend folks check that out. Tweeted this jokingly, kind of, what do you do? It's obviously like an ideal kind of ideal hand, but I found it interesting to think about, can we do better than some of the simple, most obvious plays? So, well, let's show you the deck for you, pause the video. All right, here's the deck. It's a Cyrus Storm list that Brian's playing. You've got your Tinkle Target main is Bolas Citadel, and you know Mana Vault, Soul Ring, Lotus, Lion's Eye Diamond. Those are the Tinkle Target defense grid, and that's important, obviously. And obviously, with Dark Petition, you're typically getting, getting cards like Yagmas Will, Tendrils of Agony, Necropotence, Demonic Tutor, those types of things. So that's what's in the deck. So pause the video. What would you do? How would you play this? All right, welcome back. Let's talk through this. So I think that the level one line is probably Badlands Duress. See what the opponent's working with. Don't give them a chance to counter even your mana. 
And then assuming that they have, you know, one or fewer force of will, force of negation type of effects, then we're going to go right into Mana Crypt, Lotus, Tinker, Floating 2 Blue, go get the Bolas of Citadel, and that's usually good enough. So, I mean, how good is it? Well, we've only got 13 lands in our deck. We'll have, you know, we might, we'll, we'll probably, we do want to fetch first. I said bad lands, that's actually wrong. It's a subtle but important point. We want, we'd want to fetch to thin our deck if we take this line. So, we actually fetch so that we'd have 10 lands left in our deck. So, 10 out of, you know, at that point, we'd have 51 cards. And our we die when the top card of our deck is a land. We don't necessarily die, but we can't kill our opponent that turn. Um, but there's a lot of other things that can go right because we've got some mana floating and just such a powerful card. So in general, in Vintage, Tinker for the Citadel is pretty strong, but can we do better than that? So I was thinking, well, what if we duress the opponent off the Lotus? So now we've got two black floating. And then... If we play the Delta, go get a blue source, play the Mana Crypt, the land we get and the Mana Crypt can play Tinker, and Tinker can go get Mana Vault. Mana Vault, in addition to the two black we had floating, can cast Dark Petition. And now that we have Duress and Tinker in our graveyard, Spell Mastery's on, we'll get three black. We can get Yogmoth's Will. So I thought, like, oh, well, we, if, we, if we will with Lotus, Mana Crypt, Tinker in our graveyard, and Dark Petition, like, that ought to be lethal. Well, it actually, when I, then so I tweeted that out, and I thought, like, oh, I, th this should be a kill. But when you go to actually kill, it's dicey, because you have three black, you go get will, now you have nothing floating. You replay the Lotus, Tinker can't really get you mana, because you don't have anything in your deck except Lion's Eye Diamond that is, it, it, you'd be breaking even. Dark Petition, you can spend five mana to get three black and a card, but three black, not quite enough to play Tendril, so what are you getting? So it turns out if you do if you just think about the best the most you can really make in terms of mana off of a, a Yogmoth's Will is the best you can do is either Tinker, which again is just gonna put the Bullets of Citadel into place. You're kinda of back to where you started and all, all you you have some storm, but not much else. Or you can, you know, Yogmoth's Will and you're gonna have three black and not be able to do do much. So okay, what about if the opponent, if you just thought, you, my opponent always plays shops, you're paired up against Montolio or something, always play shops, I'm just going to go for it. So if I just don't duress, then I'll have an extra mana, right? And that, that'll be enough mana. Well, the problem is if you don't duress, you don't have spell mastery. So if you don't duress, then when you dark petition, you're, you're not even going to get the black mana, you're, you'll, you'll be done. So really the best you can do is actually probably black lotus first, sack for black, duress, and we do, the, do that so we have black floating when we play the... Tinker and then black floating is better because we have dark petition in our hand. So should we, you know, hit something that makes colorless or random moxin or whatever? We'll have the black mana for dark petition. That's probably the best we can do. Duress them off lotus. If, if and now you're leading lotus, if they decide to force will lotus, that's fine. Our hand can play perfectly well without it. We can duress our opponent. We can even tinker if we feel like they don't have a force, another, another force of will. We can choose what we want to do, but we're fine against that. So we don't mind. So lead lotus, duress. That's what I do here. So Brian did not blow it by duressing and tinkering for um, for Citadel. Now, I hope that he, the precise accuracies here would be to use Lotus first and to sack the Delta that's in the deck of a land. I don't know if he did that, but he didn't blow it. All right, thanks for watching today. Send me the examples if you get them. Just message me on Twitter, at sick of it. Um, send me the screenshots that, like the ones I displayed today. The hand that you got or the situation, the deck list is helpful. Gameplay decisions are perfect. Subscribe to the channel if you want to get this get an alert when this content comes out. Subscribe and next to that little bell, put notifications on. That way you'll get an alert when this stuff comes out. And um, I appreciate I've been enjoying engaging with fans who disagree with a play I made. I'm learning something. Certainly I make a video. I'm not. I don't get everything right. I appreciate the comments and I appreciate folks subscribe and share. So thank you.